This episode is brought to you by Editor X. I've been hearing some really great things from the design community lately about Editor X, the advanced web creation platform. Designers are getting a euphoric feeling, don't misinterpret that, while working on a simple yet mighty visual design software with the capabilities and results of a powerful website builder. Whether you're a designer who loves to code or wouldn't touch JavaScript with a 10-foot lightsaber, Editor X is for you. Stay tuned to learn more about the powerful features of Editor X. In the meantime, of course, unless you're driving or doing the clean and jerk, please visit userdefenders.com slash Editor X and discover the new standard in web design. I was just going home and I was a wreck. Like, muscles that I didn't know could twitch were twitching and my stomach was in knots. And, you know, I stepped back and I, I had this moment of realization where I thought, I have to do something about this. If not for myself, because this is obviously taking a toll, but I realized that because I wasn't embracing conflict, I also, by default, was not building the best product I could. I wasn't being the best teammate I could. And I wasn't being the best human that I could. And I began to shift from being anti-conflict to pro-resolution. Welcome to the User Defenders Podcast, where we interview UX superheroes who fight for the users in order to inspire and equip you to do the same. And now, here's your host, Jason Ogle. Greetings, User Defenders. Welcome to Episode 77. I'm your host, Jason Ogle. Today I have Josh Malden with me on the show, and today we definitely focus more on the also important personal growth part of the show. Josh Malden shows us how resolving conflict not only makes us better humans, but better designers. He addresses how conflict has increased much more with the new normal of remote work and guides us on how to best recognize and resolve it. He challenges us to approach conflict with a growth mindset and the question, what can I learn from this to help us become less anti-conflict and more pro-resolution? He articulates the difference between healthy and unhealthy conflict and teaches us why health Healthy conflict is good and even worth pursuing. He reminds us that it all comes back to empathy, which as I say does not mean agreeing with someone, but making an active effort to understand where they're coming from. He also reveals how embracing conflict is the catalyst for building the best teams, the best products, the best you. It's a great episode, Defender, and we could all use a little more conflict resolution superpowers, especially these days. I hope you enjoy the episode, and thank you so much for listening to User Defenders. Defenders, today I have Josh Malden with me. He's a director of design at Artium presently, and he's been speaking all over the world about conflict resolution, and that's what we're going to be talking about today specifically. So I'm super excited to dive in. This show is about UX design and personal growth. This is all about that second bullet point and what I'm trying to do here on the show, because I really believe that being a great designer begins and ends with being a great human. We're always going to be in conflict. There's always going to be moments, uh, and that's just human nature. That's life, right? So I'm super excited to have Josh on here and to learn a lot of good tools and tips, how to better resolve conflict and, and how we can actually use conflict to our advantage. I'm really interested in that. So just a, a couple more things about Josh. He's written for Smashing Magazine. And he's done videos with O'Reilly Media for, on training, and he's done a lot of different things with them. You love approaching design with as much curiosity and humanity as you can muster. I really like that. That's a really great statement, man. So he's also a big fan of dogs. Cats too, but mostly dogs. <laughs> and I appreciate that. I'm with you too. Sorry, cat people. And so <laughs> this is fun. This is his fun fact that I really, I, this is, this really brought a, an, an interesting visual into my mind. But his nickname in high school was Gumby because he could tie himself into a pretzel and jump rope with his arms. <laughs> so with that, <laughs> welcome officially, Josh, to User Defenders. I'm super excited to have you on the show today. Thanks. Thanks. Pumped to be here. And uh, I'm definitely an equal opportunity animal petter, so I'll pet anything once. Okay. All right. Well, we'll leave that there. Uh, so, <laughs> okay. Uh, so conflict resolution, you've gone all in on this, man. I mean, how, how long have you been thinking about this? How long have you been really researching around this and writing about this and, and you're doing workshops now? Well, I've been playing with this idea basically since I was a kid because I was 
like my upbringing, you basically had two responses that you could give an adult. It was either yes, ma'am, or yes, sir. And if you didn't like it, it's tough. Really, really sorry for you. Grew up in the South. Which, yeah, yeah sure did. <laughs> How did I know? Yeah, well, you might hear me say bless your heart once in a while or other not, Southernisms. And not in an insulting way, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, definitely not. Definitely not. So that really prepared me well for being a good kid. Like I was a nice kid. I, I, I listened. I didn't act ugly, as we would say in the South. But it really did not prepare me well for working with other humans. And so I was unknowingly on the search to figure out, like, how the heck do I work with other humans? And I've really actively been researching it for probably the last seven or eight years. I ended up getting my first consulting gig. I was dropped in the middle of a situation where we had an engineer who was treating all of the designs that we made, that the client approved, that we tested as just a suggestion. I had a PM on the other side of things who wasn't communicating with the team and just making decisions and committing us to engineering and design decisions that we didn't get to weigh in on. And so I felt like I was the Hulk when all the enemies like pile on him. It's like, they're just coming from all sides. <laughs> and uh, I was just going home and I was a wreck. Like mm -hmm. muscles that I didn't know could twitch were twitching and my stomach was in knots. And, you know, I stepped back and I, I had this moment of realization where I thought, okay, I have to do something about this. If not for myself, because this is obviously taking a toll, but I realized that because I wasn't embracing conflict, I also, by default, was not building the best product I could. I wasn't being the best teammate I could, and I wasn't being the best human that I could. And I began to shift from being a more of anti-conflict to pro-resolution. It's been a, a really interesting journey. And you know now I've helped a lot of people with this framework that I've made, and I've adapted it a bit over time as I've gotten verbally punched in the face a few too many times. <laughs> Just to continue with the Hulk metaphor. I've refined this over time and I feel really comfortable having conflict. I might still be nervous inside, but I know how to approach it. And so it doesn't scare me anymore. And one of the reasons that I, I continue to do this is I see this in so many other teams and so many other people. And it's embracing conflict is the catalyst for building the best teams, the best you, and the best products. Yeah, I fully agree with that. We're all so different as humans. We all have different quirks, right? And yeah. and all it takes is just a little time with somebody for those to kind of start to emerge. And that's why love is such an important quality and characteristics because love really does suffer long. I always tell folks, if you can wait at least a year to get engaged, if you're going to get married, I promise you by that time, you will know all the idiosyncrasies, all the quirks on that person. And then you can go all in with a, a really more sound, possibly sound decision. I've heard this analogy too, that I thought was really interesting about kind of about conflict and, and it even could be definitely framed, of course, in a marriage and a committed relationship is like, it's sometimes it's like two porcupines it's cold and they're trying to snuggle and all they're doing is like jabbing each other. <laughs> <laughs> what an image. I, I could great? dig it though. I could dig it. Yeah. That works, yeah. right? It's, I'm really happy to hear you sort of make that connection between personal relationships and relationships at work. I think that there's a lot of commonality there. And so these like personal relationship metaphors really do carry when it comes to thinking about life at work. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that, man. And you know, it's funny, like, well, of course, before COVID, before we all went remote, for the most part, unless we're essential workers, right? We spent more time at work than we did at home with our families. In a way, we were married to these people, <laughs> whether we said I do or not. You have this boss, you love this boss, and he or she is amazing. And then what happens? They move on, either at will or at the employer's will. And you're like, oh shoot, who's coming in next? right? It's like a neighbor, right? And your neighbors move. You're like, oh crap, I better start paying for really good neighbors because you can't put a price. You can't put a price on good neighbors, man. All that to say that happens a lot. We are married in a way, in a weird way. We're married to the folks that we work with. Now, that's a perfect segue, Josh, to my next question for you, because most of us are remote now, whether we like it or not. I actually particularly like it. My gas tank is 
I don't have to fill it up all the time. That helps the environment. Like everybody wins kind of thing. I don't have to keep getting repairs on my vehicle. I was driving nearly two hours a day each way for quite a while. And I liked the wow, job. Wow, so wow. I did it. Great job is worth the drive. So and great people, of course, that's a big part of that. But I, I actually really like it. But I'm curious, like, have you noticed particularly inner office? Has inner office conflict increased or decreased since most of us have gone remote? Have you made any observations around that? Yeah, <laughs> I've had a few I've, I've had quite a few conversations with folks and yeah, the amount of conflict has gone up and it's mostly been a function of we're all stuck at home. I've worked with folks who have several kids in a small house and they're naturally a little bit crankier than they would normally be if they were in a dedicated space like an office for work. But you know, like we don't sleep as well as we used to. And so we're <laughs> a little crankier and because we're not in the presence of one another physically, we also sort of lose some fidelity to our conversations. Like, you know, if you and I were together, like I could get a much better read on your body language, your tone of voice, talking to you through Skype or whatever medium we use that's digital, like there's compression of the audio. And so like, I'm not getting the full fidelity of your voice. And so once we start to lose that fidelity, our brain does this like weird thing, which has like been incredibly helpful in helping us survive, you know, back when we were like hunter gatherers, we basically fill in the gaps with negative information and it served us for our survival. But in 2021, it, it kind of gets in the way of things. And so when I lose this fidelity in this conversation with you, like I might not have video with you. I might only be able to talk to you through Slack. There's just so much more room for misunderstanding. And so conflict just by its very nature is, is going to come out of those kind of things and that resentment builds because you're not always able to see what someone means like perhaps someone's being sarcastic and they're not super good at using emojis or conveying that and it just hits <laughs> you the wrong way oh man yeah the ascii text can be so misleading from an emotional perspective that's why i i, I love the convenience man quick little bottle rockets right like I'll tell you just what I want you to know at just the right time that I'm, I'm willing to tell you. But man, there's so much lost in translation with just seeing text. And that's why, again, emojis do help, but not everybody uses them. Not everybody wants to use them. And that can be challenging. So I appreciate you bringing up body language and eye contact. And that was another thought that I had around this remote life that we're all living now and working through and it's been a big adjustment for many of us you can't require someone to turn their camera on during a slack or a zoom meeting you can't force someone to do that and that's good i think that's a respectful thing respect their privacy you don't know what's going on we all we're working out of our homes some folks don't have an extra bedroom for an isolated office and so there's understandably going to be a little bit of chaos behind them. And, you know, and some folks are, you know, they forget that the camera's actually on and they're doing weird things. So we, <laughs> there's been a slew of that. stories. <laughs> there's been a slew of that too. But, but back to my, my point about, you know, body language, like that is so important. Eye contact. We weren't designed to, to really relate to each other in this way. We, this is not the, like you mentioned, the, the hunter gathering, like the tribes, that kind of strength in a tribe. When you don't have those things, when you lose those things, it can be really difficult. And if somebody doesn't want to turn their camera on, you don't really know what their face looks like. You don't know what they're feeling. I'm pretty good at reading. I'm an empath and I think you are too. You're an empath, aren't you? Yeah. I knew it. <laughs> and so <laughs> I just knew it. it. Takes one to know one, as they say. It does. It all leads back to empathy, honestly. This whole journey, it all leads back to empathy. But my question really is have you found other creative ways to maybe mitigate, like possibly resolving a conflict with somebody, or even just like checking up on somebody if they're not showing you their cards, so to speak? You, you get a gut feeling, especially as an empath. You just kind of know when somebody's feeling. And I think I read somewhere on something you wrote where you can actually read people's feelings before they even know they're feeling it. Like, I'm like, okay, this guy's an empath, you know? So tell me, tell me about, have you found other creative ways to mitigate when you can't see somebody's face and when you know they're struggling even, right? I'm not even talking about yeah. re resolving conflict, but how do you encourage somebody, you know, about this going yeah. through that? I, I would actually frame it as a, a form of, of conflict, like you, because someone is in conflict with like saying what they're feeling they may not feel totally safe doing that. Right. Internal um, conflict too, right? It's their, their own dude, conflict. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So a few things come to mind. One, I want to talk about emojis for a second. Two, I want to talk about a couple of techniques to get people to open up. So one, 
I, I thought it was great that you on your own brought up emojis because I ended up reading this study uh, a few months ago that showed that we basically interpret smileys and like emojis in the same way that we would a normal human. And so there some some folks have a stigma against using emoji they don't think it's very professional but you know i i think that you got to be you got to be adaptable and resilient to the situation at hand and if you're being more remote like use everything at your disposal to really make it safe for someone to interpret what you're saying a couple of other tools that come up for me to get people to open up are like you know you can get i i think most of us are able to tell like if there's a little bit of a disconnect between what someone is saying and what they're doing with their body or their, the tone of their voice or something like that. And so I have this tool that I use to just uh, add contrast to the conversation. So the, the general framework is I'm not saying X, I'm saying Y. And that has by and large been the thing that has corrected so many misunderstandings and that's specifically because like we we lost all that fidelity in our conversation and so someone can go down this path of like you know you're an absolute jerk i'll, I'll try to keep my language pg-13 <laughs> <laughs> it's okay i'll put a little uh, kapow in there if you do happen to swear it's okay really <laughs> yeah like a, a batman pow Shit. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's that's the only one. Thank you. That's the only one. Yeah. So, God, I, I just joked and absolutely lost my place. Oh, so contrast. Yeah. So getting people to get realigned with what the goal of this conversation is and what you're actually saying can be really helpful. But I also think about folks just not generally feeling safe. And if they don't want to open up, like you're not gonna be able to make someone really open up if they don't want to. And I think knowing that going into the conversation can really alleviate a lot of stress because like a lot of times our mindset for conflict with one another is like very much framed in terms of me and not we. And it's very much like, I need to win. Like I need to get this done my way, despite what most of us say that we want something for the greater good. Like if, if we're honest with ourselves, a lot of our conflict comes from just this misalignment between what we want and what's actually good for everyone. Yeah. So the, the mindset of just like, you know, this is, this is the thing about us. This is a path of forging together, I think is, is really, really, really important because even if you're not able to get someone to open up in that moment, what you've done is you're you're basically keeping the soil fertile. Like I, I very much look at this like you're you're growing something in soil. Like there are a lot of metaphors for for life and work and burnout and things like that in this. But yeah, if you're able to just like keep the soil fertile, keep it watered, sometime something's gonna sprout up, and you're gonna be able to like attend to it. So you got to play the long game, I guess is what I'm saying. I really like the gardening analogy too. It just makes so much sense. I've been married for yeah. 21 years. You could say my marriage is legal drinking age now. And that's my dad, <laughs> my dad joke. I know you've got several up your sleeve. I'd like to see if we can catch one before our time is up here. Um, I'm more of a faux pas at this point because we don't have kids. <laughs> that's fair. Do, do yeah. you have a rim shot sound effect that you also put in? <laughs> I do now. So, but yeah, the reality is, is that if I, if I didn't treat my marriage like a garden, I wouldn't be married still. I mean, that's just the reality. If it was just uh, all about me trying to get what I want and not listening to my wife, not, not compromising, right? Not partnering with her, it wouldn't last long. And that's the reality of it. There's so many parallels to our office relationships, to our marriages and to just friendships, everything, right? This, that's why I love this topic. I love that we're talking about this. You came up with a, a, a resolution, a conflict resolution framework, and I want to know kind of how you came up with this and, and if you can even highlight what that looks like, what's that framework look like? Yeah. The framework is really a lot like a pyramid. It's got four big levels at the bottom is psychological safety. And that was actually something that I did not realize initially that needed to be there. But the longer that I spent researching and understanding and talking to people 
about conflict. So much of it stems from the fact that we don't feel psychologically safe with one another. I can't really have like an effective resolution to something if I don't feel safe with you because like I'm not going to open up to you. So that's underpinning everything that we do. And the next level on top of that is facts. I, I know that we live in a world of alternative facts now, but let's Let's talk about the non-alternative, the alternative to the alternative. So the, that next level is facts. You're, you're talking about those things that are observable. Like if you were, if you had a security camera that was like overlooking your situation, like what would it see? And those sort of, it's, it's like showing your homework on a math assignment. They're going to show how you got to the next stage, which is conclusions. When you talked over me three times in that meeting, it made me feel like you didn't respect me in the same way that you respected Jim. And you can also say at the very top of that pyramid, because this is a dialogue, is others input. Like you want to see how they're seeing it because you only see your side of the story. You don't hear it from their perspective. And having that back and forth really helps you get to the bottom of what the issue is. I read a couple of your blogs recently. If you have, you've been writing about this. You mentioned the cranky conclusions. One. <laughs> I, I thought that was really an interesting perspective. Can you touch on that a little bit too? Kind of how that works? Yeah. Yeah. So you know, the, the way that I like to approach this is like, I want to see what's the worst thing that somebody could say about me? Or like, how are they going to say that I contributed to this situation? And this really primes your brain to be empathetic with the other person because you are literally putting yourself in their position. Mm -hmm. And it can help in a lot of ways. One way is that if you're scared that this conversation is really going to get weird and like go sideways, you can lead off in your conversation with something from your cranky conclusions. Like you're going to say that I'm a diva, that I'm not a team player, and that I only care about what's best for me. And it's a, it's a way of sort of short circuiting some of those like pathways that we, we tend to take when we might feel threatened. So it's, it's, uh, it's like a Swiss army knife. I, you know, you can, you can use it several different ways. I like to use it before I have a conversation with someone just so I can understand like, okay, what are they seeing? How are they seeing it? How might they be seeing it? And it can sort of help me tune my approach. I'm very analytical and pragmatic about these things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I know. And that's why I love that you're talking about this because you've obviously thought a lot about it and you've had a lot of situations where you've been able to practice this and with success. And so I like that. The one thought I had, and I'll play advocate for a second. I'll, I'll, I'll challenge just one aspect of this where you say it's sort of like leading in with the, I know I'm going to sound like an a-hole right now, but you know, like, or I'm not trying to be, it's really, no, it's like, I'm not trying to be an a-hole. Anytime that somebody says that, like, I know that, that you question their motive. So how do you, <laughs> right? Have you heard that? Like, how do you navigate that? Oh my it's gosh. Like, anytime yeah, somebody says, like, I'm not trying to be something, and then they follow it up with what they're trying to tell you, your human instinct, <laughs> especially if you were very high in emotional intelligence, you're like, okay, you, you're going to be an a, you're going to come off as an a-hole right now. <laughs> But is it softening right, the right, blow? Right, right. Tell me more about that. I, I've definitely experienced the like, <laughs> I'm not racist, but oh, so shoot. it's 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 very much like an apology that has a but in it. It's like, I'm sorry, but okay. the but negates everything that comes after it. And so I specifically try to avoid using things like, but I'm going to talk to you about this. It's, it's very much framed in terms of like, hey, I think you're going to think this. I need you to hear me out though. And it's it's a very small thing that you can do in how you talk to someone that signals a great deal about where you're coming from and what your intentions are. And those tiny words like but or and, those can really get trippy and make you seem inauthentic. An a-hole, as you would say. <laughs> Two words you never wanna say in your relationship and your working relationship, whatever relationship, you never want to go to somebody and say, you always, and you never, never say never. It's such a limiting belief. It gives the person no perceived room for growth. It's like, well, if I always do something and if I never do something, well then 
I guess you've just kind of canceled out any uh, opportunity for growth that I might have as an individual and it shuts them down. It, it strips away the pillar, the foundation of your, con your uh, res conflict resolution framework, which is psychological mm -hmm. safety. You've just effectively stripped out the foundation that the whole pyramid has crumbled now at this point. Right? Exactly. Yeah. 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 When you, when you do things like that, it really does undermine safety because what you're doing is you're passing a judgment and the magic thing for conflict resolution is to be able to be aware of what you're feeling and what conclusions you're drawing, but not letting them be set in stone. It's more about observing and being mindful of where you are and also having a separate mind for like, okay, this is where the situation is. This is what I'm seeing. This is what I'm hearing. This is what I'm feeling. I thought it was really interesting that you talked about limiting beliefs because how we frame something really affects the outcome. I remember reading about a study that was done at the University of Rochester for students taking their final exams. And the people who had framed it positively, like, I'm going to try and earn an A on this versus the people who framed it negatively, you know, I don't want to fail. The interesting result to this was that the students who framed their situation as positive did as good as the negative students did bad. <laughs> so it just, it, it's, it's wow. wild, like just how much having like a growth mindset and a discovery mindset and conversations in life and work can really change a lot of outcomes. And, you know, if you're looking at conflict from this negative standpoint, like, oh my God, why do I have to do this? This dude again, here he goes. Like, you're obviously going to be approaching that from a much different perspective than like, okay, what can I learn from this? How can we move forward together? Like just looking for those little paths is it's kind of like a fun little like explorer thing for your brain. You get to like find new places and scavenger hunt. Right, 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 right. <laughs> As designers, we know we need constraints, but we also want, like my manager says, get creative inside the box. Thankfully, Editor X gives you absolute design freedom. The workspace is so intuitive, plus they've combined CSS control with smooth drag and drop. You get developer level control in a designer's world, so there's total accuracy while crafting entirely responsive killer layouts. Good design is good business. Another super impressive feature of Editor X is its integrated business solutions, including easy to use e-commerce tools, blogs, Blogs, events, and booking systems. You'll feel like a superhero knowing whatever web magic you create will fulfill the needs of any top tier brand. Finally, while I don't believe time is money, reduced time to market can certainly save you and your company a buttload of it. Take comfort knowing you'll be creating beautiful and powerful sites in no time, since Editor X streamlines the workflow and enhances collaboration. Ever innovating like good designers should, the folks behind Editor X are always making making things better. They recently launched shareable design libraries, and I've got the inside scoop that there are more game-changing team features coming soon. I can keep talking about it, but you should really go see it for yourself. Visit userdefenders.com slash editor X and discover the new standard in web design. Yeah, I like that. And I was thinking about leadership too. Like this, this might be a conversation that leaders may want to really prick up their ears, if you will, to as we kind of start to dive into this, because as we were talking about always and never, and you know, honestly, like a leader that says that to their people is not a good leader, frankly, first and foremost is not a good leader, does not have their people's best interests in mind is not a servant leader for sure has a big ego, most likely. And as we know, your ego is not your amigo. So I was just I thinking, saw that on a t-shirt once. Yeah. Didn't you <laughs> userdefenders.com slash store. So, a better way to say, and I think I did read this in one of your, in one of your blogs as well. in one of your articles about instead of saying, you know, you, you're always late to the meeting, right? Like say, you know, Hey, I noticed that the last three meetings you've been late. Is there something, is, is there something that going on that I can help with? Right. So it, what it does is it, it, it still allows room for growth, right? It doesn't, it doesn't come at that person with a limiting belief of like, you're never going to get this right. 
right? And and that's crushing. That's really crushing. And it, again, it strips the psychological safety, but frame it better. If you're a leader and, and you're approaching issues, you're approaching conflict this way, please stop, All right? Please try to you know have some higher emotional intelligence, have deeper empathy for your folks. Like you can address things. The point is you can address important issues without crushing somebody's soul and, and without making them feel like there's just no room for growth. And there's something called the Pygmalion effect that I think is perfect in this context. It's the meaning of it is the expectation of those around you establish your own personal rules and expectations. And that's especially for leaders. Like that's, that's an actual uh, psychological effect that scientists have studied. And I think it's really important as a leader to always leave room for growth for your people and to serve them, be a servant leader, because they're going, I promise you it's going to affect their performance. If you're, you're trained to get better performance out of your people, approaching it that way is not the way. Because they're you have the Pygmalion effect. The expectations of those around you establish your own personal rules and expectations. So always expect high things. You can you can put some pressure on your people to perform better without being an a-hole. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I I remember writing something not too long ago that's that was around like a good manager's skill set includes the ability to listen, be quiet and listen, shut up and listen. Seriously, be quiet. They probably already know the answer and need to talk it out. It's, I like that. It's, it's, thanks. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just really interesting. Like, you know, we were taught to solve problems, like, in, and that's part of like the script that we tend to follow. And when you get to leadership, you really have to make those adjustments and, and not think like that. You know, my advice to leaders would be that there's this interesting thing called the self determination theory, which came to prominence in the 80s. But basically, we have several basic psychological needs. And there are three that have application directly to work and conflict. And it's you know, autonomy, which is like, I choose to do these things. Competence, I can do these things. And belonging, which is like, I'm a part of this thing. And so when these, these three things get crushed, those are the things that lead to your team burning out, not trusting you, those unreasonable expectations. And like you, you don't have that good mindset as a leader. Definitely. Now, in dealing with conflict with your leadership, that's really hard as serving under somebody. And there's, I don't know, there's for one reason or another, there's some major conflict. What are the best ways to deal with conflict with your leadership, right? If you have an issue, like you need to address it. Like what are the best ways to do that while still practicing self-preservation of what does Mike Montero say? Staying alive is not a soft skill. <laughs> <laughs> Man, that guy can turn a phrase. Yeah, that's, no doubt. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, you don't want to have any career limiting moves when you talk to leadership. You know, I, I learned a lot about this some of the things that really stick out to me about this is this notion of having compassionate detachment. And we'll get into that in a second. Hmm. But the other thing is when you're having conflict with leadership, it's best to one, acknowledge respect for their position and that you might not see everything. Two, let them know that you're not just there for your own benefit to further your own agenda and three try and work it out with them like let them know what's going on and how it's affecting the business if you have a leader who's changing their mind at the last minute like oh actually we need to add this new sign up flow i i like this other button color better and you know it's it's right before you you ship your product if this happens a few times you can go to your leader and say, can we find a way to get you involved earlier? Because what's happening now is that we've got the team's morale is getting crushed. We're wasting, no, excuse me, I wouldn't use that term. It's, <laughs> it's costing a lot of extra money and a lot of extra churn. How do you think we should proceed? And that's where this idea of compassionate detachment comes in, where you go in and you make your best case and then you lead it because you're not responsible for the ultimate outcome. I've learned that as a human, that's it's a very healthy thing. And two, like I've also learned that as just a, a consultant and a designer, I've been able to give my full self to a project. And sometimes it doesn't go the way that I think it's going to go. But, you know, the only thing I can really control is the input. 
uh, I can't always control the output. And just knowing that has been really freeing and letting me advocate for what I think is the best for the users, for the business, and leave it in the hands of other folks. Sometimes they're going to make mistakes. Sometimes they're going to bump their heads. My goal is just to be there when they fall down, pick them up, and turn them around and let them go. So not all conflict is unhealthy. In fact, right. there is such a thing as healthy conflict. And I think maybe we could all use a little bit more of that. I feel like everything, I mean, all you have to do is flip on the news for a few seconds, and then you'll see a lot of unhealthy conflict. It's a crazy world. So, I mean, we need, we all need more of this. We all need to learn how to resolve conflict in a, in a more healthy way. So can you help us understand what healthy conflict looks like and why we should, in fact, pursue it more? Yeah, I tend to look at healthy conflict as a way of building a better relationship, building a better product. And to contrast that, we've got the unhealthy conflict, which is the like verbal abuse can be physical abuse, basically sure. things which actively harm you emotionally or physically like that kind of conflict is not healthy. We want to get out of that. We want to be safe. You know, that can also mean like the unhealthy conflict can be you've got folks who are yelling at you, folks who are gaslighting you. Th those things are extremely unhealthy. But the healthy kind is for the benefit of the collective. It's for the benefit of your relationship. I typically look at it like what's going to further our goals and what's going to detract from our goals is like healthy versus unhealthy. Yeah, that makes sense. You can almost frame this in a way of you have cancer, but your doctor doesn't want to hurt your feelings. So they're going to, you know, I don't, I know that this would really mess up their day to tell them. And I'm sorry. I, I apologize. I know that's a very serious subject. I'm not trying to make light of that at all. But the reality is, is that your doctor, if you have cancer, by God, you want your doctor to tell you as soon as possible, as soon as they possibly know. And I, I think that that's sort of a, a way to look at the healthy conflict, the healthy tension even, because yeah. we need that. And we need to push each other, especially in a team. We need to push each other. If we really care about our teammates, we'll want to do that. We'll want to try to do some nudges that are, that are, Hey, I know you can do better than this. That's hard to say as a leader. It's hard to say to your people, like, that's just not good enough. I know you can, but frame it in. I know you can do better. I, I feel like that that's, we need a little more healthy conflict. I think we need to, to we need a little more grit too. all of us. We need a yeah. little more grit because we're not seeing our full potential right now. I believe that I have kids. I have a lot of them, as you know, I, I fear somewhat for their generation growing up because I just feel like that even with technology, as much as I love it, it's sort of an enabler for us to not be gritty. It's sort of an enabler for us to not do hard things. And I think the hard things can make us better humans quite often. And again, healthy conflict, approaching an issue in love, truth in love is always the best way. But I just, I guess I'm just trying to say it's important for us to pursue a healthy conflict and also to have empathy for each other because empathy is not agreeing with the other person. It's trying to understand where they're coming from. And I think we could really use a lot more of that in this day and age, personally. Wow. Yeah. I don't think I could have said that bit better. <laughs> yeah. Empathy is really just the magic sauce for conflict resolution. You want to put yourself in the other person's shoes. You don't have to agree with it, but you want to see what they're seeing. Yeah. And you can't really have an effective outcome if you're not listening to the other person. And what is empathy if not listening? Yeah. Well said. So... Before we get into the Super 7, I do want to talk about product because there's a lot of designers listening. It's UX design and personal growth. So how does Healthy Conflict make a better product? I know you've got some stories and I know you've got some some good tips on on how that works. So I'd love to hear that before we jump into your, the Super 7 here. Yeah, yeah. So as far as how this relates to building products, I recall working with an architect, as a UX architect, on a sign-up flow. And we both had very different opinions on what we should do. My opinion was, let's delay sign-up as long as possible, just so that we can get people in, get them looking around. The, uh, the other person had this view that it should be us locking them out until they sign up or sign in. And we just, we went back and forth about it. And we just kept butting heads. And finally, I 
pulled out this tool that I learned from Cap Watkins while he was at Etsy, and it was called the sliding scale of giving a uh, kapow. And so basically you're like, you know, how strongly do I feel about this? And so I stepped back and I was like, okay, where are you on the sliding scale? And I said that I was an eight and they said that they were a seven. And so we just decided to settle it that way. We went with delaying sign up so that we could get people to look around. A few weeks later, we were talking about how we should ask for people's emails to get them to sign up for our newsletters. And the back and forth happened. Then they pulled out the uh, where you're on the sliding scale and I was much lower on it. And so we decided that we would roll their way. So the, the more that you can just like push and gently poke each other, like you mentioned earlier, you know, I, th I think you can do better. Like, I think we can do better. I think we should iterate on this a little bit. Can we go down this rabbit hole for like 10 minutes because I feel like there's something there. That kind of mindset can be really transformational for building good products. Like so often we're focused on just achieving this goal. Like I wanna get a 10% lift in subscribers. I, I want 20% more in referral links. It's, it's almost like being a horse and just having those blinders on and just like running towards the goal. And I think if we can sit with a problem, we can poke at it with someone and go back and forth about it for a while, we'll find all of these little neat connections that we can make and bring together to form like this much more customized, tailored solution for something. And you can't get there if you're not sitting with the problem and having healthy conflict with someone about it. Yeah, fully agree. Agile, mm -hmm. not to get off on a rabbit trail here, okay? Because I, I, I do <laughs> want to get into your Super 7, but yeah, ha has Agile been a somewhat of a double-edged sword in this, you think? I just got to get, I got to ship this code by this by this two-week sprint, right? I got to ship this code. I got to, and the designer's like, I always got to be ahead. Oh, well, crap, this sucks. This, this, I don't like this design, but I got to ship it because I got to stay ahead of the developers. Has, has yeah. it been a bit of a, a double-edged sword in a way, do you think? Yeah, this framework is, that I work on is a framework just like Agile. And you run into problems when you blindly follow it. Like, I'm from the South. I have a great recipe for biscuits. The secret is the flour that we use. But if, if I take that recipe and make it in North Carolina, I'm going to have some amazing biscuits. But if I go visit you in Colorado Springs, which is a much higher elevation, my biscuits are not going to do well. And so... <laughs> You know, I, I need to make sure that everything is tailored to the environment. And the way that that relates back to, to Agile is the more you blindly follow something, the harder it's going to be to do the right thing. And, mm. you know, checklists are easy, but if you think about things in terms of a toolbox, it unlocks a lot for you. And I think that Agile is, has really not been a great place for design. Basically what we've had to do is we've had to add another track on top of the delivery track where we do research and stuff. And I, I think that it's like design has just been bolted on and it, it doesn't leave a lot of room for designers to really contribute because you have your backlog and your engineers who are so driven to like, all right, we have this story, we're gonna deliver this story. Which is a good thing, costs. right? Which is a good, I mean, yeah, they, you they absolutely to. have to have that. Yeah. 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 And I, I definitely don't want to downplay that. Like yeah. Agile has, has been really helpful for getting people to find ways of shipping things very quickly. I don't have to defend Agile. There's a lot of like great things about it. Right. And involving um, the customer along the way, which is great. These are all great things. Right. But yes, the, absolutely. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. It's just, okay. that, that was more of a personal rant. Like I, I love it. I, I love it and I hate it at the same time. It's so, it's such a conflict because you, you want the product as a designer, you want the product to reflect the, your, the, precision that you put into like the the front end there's always that tug of war with design and, and engineering and and so like there's a whole conflict there like maybe that could be your next blog josh okay we'll leave it there <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, i'll publish it on uh, user defenders public publication that that sounds good just the title would be let's hang out with your engineer that's that's the title because that's it. where the magic is yes
Absolutely. I love, we love our engineers. So we, I love the collaboration. I love, I'm in a, I'm in a really good place right now where the engineering team, like they really, we've proven the value of design. And that's sometimes maybe one of the reasons why there is so much conflict with designers and engineers is because maybe we designers haven't proven yet the value of design. So uh, thankfully we've been able to do that. I give a lot of credit to my manager. He's just, he's awesome, man. He just, He's really brought UX into the foreground of where, what we're doing. And there's a lot more respect. It's mutual respect. You want respect, you give respect. Exactly. It's neat. It's interesting how that works. Yeah, like so, the, the best things that I've found, the best solutions that I've found come from me spending time with engineers and PMs. Like engineers have built the, you know, menus and tab bars and like cool interactions tons of times and tons of different projects. And so that experience can really save you. And it's just personally very rewarding for me when I get to work through something with an engineer and they're like, hey, actually, if we did this, it would save several API calls and still get you what you need. And the best engineers are, are going to be empathetic towards design and the best designers are going to be empathetic towards engineering and PM. Yes. Yes. Amen. It's it's again, it, it's the superhero analogy works. The Justice League couldn't do it with one superhero. Neither could the Avengers. Right. So we're we're equal opportunity with uh, DC and Marvel yeah. here. Are you are you are you a Snyder Cut fan or is it like you want the original Justice League? Like, do, <laughs> do you have a favorite? I'll be honest. I haven't seen the movie yet, so I'm a Marvel guy. Right. I'll be I'm a Marvel. I'm. It's all about Wolverine. If if you could tell by my facial hair, I just I needed to see the sideburns just to be sure. Ah, uh, yeah. So anyway, yeah. I it's I appreciate that, and I know that there's a lot of value there in that. And again, defenders. If you want respect, give respect. If you want trust, give trust. All right, let's jump into your super seven, my friend. What is your UX superpower? It. I'm really good at observing and listening. I've, as we mentioned earlier, I've been known to sense when someone is feeling something before they realize it. That's a great superpower. It really is. It can that be, I, I really don't believe that empathy is something you're either born with or without. I believe you can grow your empathy just like any other skill. One quick tip on how defenders can grow a little more in that area, just of kind of you're gaining more of, of superpower that you have. Because I know you've honed it, you've worked on it. You know, I know there's, there's some inherent things too. We're all products of our environments, our upbringings. But if you had one tip for the defenders to help grow and, and gain that superpower more. What would you say? I think the best thing you can do if you want to grow this is to just sit back and listen and suspend your judgment. Ooh, that's good, man. I like that. <laughs> awesome. Conversely, what's your UX kryptonite? Information overload. No question. <laughs> if you talk at me for five minutes straight, my brain's going to shut down because I, I try to process everything that someone says. And if it's too much, my brain is like, nah. I'm good. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go sit over there for a little <laughs> while and not work. Oh man, I can identify with that kryptonite, man. It's it's hard. We're, <laughs> we're we live in an information age, and I love it and I hate it. We're bombarded so much with information. Somebody got my email address, and now I get spam all the time, and now I got to spend several hours setting up filters in Gmail. <laughs> It's just like, ah, come on. I know you have an interesting UX superhero name. I kind of teased it early on. And uh, so I want to ask you now, what would your UX superhero name be? I spent a lot of time thinking about this and it came up with Captain Psionic. <laughs> and a psionic, like the, the word is just relating to the practical use of psychic powers. And Ooh. so if I were to just take the things that I do, the, the listening and, and the empathy and things like that. Like if I took it to superhero levels, that's what it would be. I like that, man. That's fun. So habits are really important as we talk about personal growth, as we talk about conflict resolution and being the best humans we can be. What is one habit that you believe contributes to your success? Listening to my intuition. We get so caught up in process and following a script, listening to data that we forget to listen to ourselves. And the more we can listen to ourselves, the more we can contribute authentically and fully to the things that we're working on. Yeah, listening. I've, I've heard that several times in this interview, listening to others. And then now you're like, listen to yourself too. I really like that. 
because it, it's just a well-rounded thing. You're not going to be able to listen well to others unless you first listen to yourself, right? Yeah, absolutely. Mm, that's cool. That's a cool takeaway. Hi, I'm Jessica, and I advocate for Black women in design, and I fight for the users. You're listening to User Defenders Podcast with Jason Ogle. What would be your most invincible UX resource or tool you would recommend to our listeners? I would recommend Deep Work by Cal Newport, mostly because of what we spoke about earlier. We're in this high information world. We're constantly bombarded by things, and that constant bombardment makes it really difficult for us to focus and, and do the valuable work which our trade and our craft needs. And so this book is going to make a solid case for why this focus time is important. And it helps identify ways of doing deep work that are going to work for you. It is, again, not a checklist or things to follow and you'll have amazing deep work. It's more about like what works for you and it helps you get to the bottom of that. Yeah, I second that recommendation, Defenders. That's one of my favorite books, honestly. And uh, you make me want to go back and read it again because I've I've kind of forgotten some of the the techniques and the tips and stuff that he's put out there. But one of the ones that, that I do remember real vividly was the shutdown routine, right? Like it's, it's kind of yeah. corny. It seems kind of corny and cheesy, but again, it's all about priming, right? We were talking about this earlier, like our mindset and how we frame something. Right. If uh, I love what he says, he says at the end of the day, when he's done doing his deep work, done doing his, his research. And by the way, Cal Newport is not on social media. If that says anything about his level of concentration and the deep work that he's able to do, there's something there. I haven't been able to quit yet. He's got, in fact, he's got a Ted talk. Have you seen this Ted talk, Josh about no, he, his, his Ted talk, I'll I link to, to it now. in the show notes. It is, he says, quit social media. That's the name of his TED talk. It's, it's fascinating, but yeah, one of his techniques is at the end of the day, you know how, when you shut your computer down, it, it'll just like say shutting down. Right. And that's, a, that's a cue. That's a cue. Like, okay, my computer is shut down. Not, not many of us shut our computers down probably enough, but we, I just, we close our little clamshell here, but he does this mental thing where he, he says out loud, he says, at the end of the day, he turns his computer off and then he says to himself, shut down complete. And it's like a, a trigger. It's like a cue that he's primed his brain to go, okay, I'm done. I am not thinking about work anymore. I am not going to be distracted by work anymore. I'm going to focus on whatever else I need to do, my family or right, whatever it is. It's not work anymore. And it's, it's just another kind of neat little technique. And again, that may not be directly related to deep work, but I promise you, if he can shut his brain down, like, like we can shut our computers down related to work. And if we can all do that, which we can, then guess what? We're going to have a more focused evening with our family, a nice dinner or whatever. We're going to maybe accomplish something else we need to do around the house. And then, and then we're going to feel accomplished to start that next day. It does help our deep work to do shutdown complete. It, it really does. And speaking to how this book helps you figure out what works for you, I've been doing that daily shutdown. I started doing some writing, you know, here are the things I accomplished, here's how I, I felt, here's what I'm thinking about. But I ended up changing it because I got really tired of looking at screens and I found this voice transcription tool called Otter. And so at 4.45 every day, I get a push notification that's like, it's time for your daily shutdown. And so what I do is I pull up the app and I talk about the things I've done that day, the things I want to do the next day, how I'm feeling. And it helps me really like empty my brain. And if I ever need to refer back to the notes, it's transcribed. So mm. it's a way that feels very natural to me. And I notice that when I write a lot, I tend to edit as I write. And so I yeah. get in my own head about it. So this helps me get it out more effectively. That's a cool tip. That could be your UX Thanks. resource or tool as well. Otter. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Otter's great, dude. That sounds cool. I like that. But you're right. As when we write, we self edit and it, it takes away from what we really were trying to say in the first place. Uh, I love the, the quote right now, blush later. Isn't that good? I like that. Yeah. It's, and so I think that that's a good way to write now and blush later. It really is. It's worked for me. Your mileage may vary. <laughs> 
All right, awesome. Josh, this is my last question for you. I want to ask you, Josh, and you've given so much, but what's your best advice for aspiring UX superheroes? Practice compassionate detachment. This is a longer discussion, but the short version is that if we really want to truly do our best work, we have to realize that we don't have final control over the outcome. And once you realize that, it's so freeing and you're able to contribute to a project in the best, fullest possible way. A very short version of that is, if you want to look it up, it's a Zen principle. I actually didn't know that when I wrote those words. There's a lot that you can learn just by Googling compassionate detachment. It's not a term that I have that's original. I appreciate that. I'll link to it as well. So Josh, this is, like I said, this has been amazing. This has been really valuable. This is a great professional skill. It's a great life skill. This is just important all around. We're always going to be collaborating, relating, mingling. We're always going to be around other human beings. And that's good. We need each other. We need our tribe for our mental health and for just every way. The best way to have successful relationships is to learn how to resolve conflict because it's going to, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. It's going to happen in any long lasting, healthy relationship. I promise you at the core, there's a really strong conflict resolution foundation. So this Absolutely. has been amazing, Josh. Thank you again so much. Before I let you go, can you tell our defenders how to best connect and to keep up with you? Yeah. On social media, despite Cal Newport's <laughs> recommendation, you can find me on Twitter. I'm at Joshua Malden and I'm also at joshuamalden.com. Awesome. Well, thanks again, Josh, so much. And uh, yeah, keep doing what you're doing. Keep researching this. Keep getting the word out. I really believe that especially the more we kind of continue to acclimate to this new normal, I hate that phrase, but it is what it is, the more we're going to need these tools and tactics to really be successful in life and, and in our careers. So thank you again, my friend. And last but not least, I just want to say, fight on, my friend. I don't, I don't, I don't. Years ago, I remember visiting the beautiful park in sunny Southern California that my wife and I were married at nearly 22 years ago. This time we were there with the first few of our young children, reminiscing. One of our kids noticed a butterfly cocoon and excitedly dragged me over to see it. Lo and behold, there was a butterfly struggling intensely to break out of it. Our immediate reaction was to try and help this poor little creature gain its freedom, seeing that it was so close yet so far from it. After receiving our aid, something unexpected happened. The butterfly fell to the ground, only able to hop around, not stretch its wings, and fly like we expected it would once we had helped free it from its struggles and major conflict contained inside of that cocoon. His name was Malmquist. I know. We said a quick prayer for Malmquist and walked away, hoping that he would eventually fly to his freedom and not be eaten by predators. I learned a big lesson later. I, of course, wished I had known then. The conflict of the cocoon and the butterfly's struggle to break out of it is imperative for it to gain the strength required in its wings to take flight and fulfill its purpose. Think about that for a second. The struggle, the conflict, was imperative for growth and freedom. I think many of us may miss this often in our lives. We tend to, of course by nature, in the pursuit of homeostasis, flee from conflict, especially the healthy kind that is imperative for our growth, when we ought to instead lean into it and see how we can be made stronger through it and even and especially in the extremely uncomfortable midst of it. Marriage is hard. But honestly, I believe that in the absence of abuse, of course, divorce can be harder. They say the grass is greener on the other side. No, not true at all. The grass is greener where you water it. At the risk of sounding preachy, I hope I'm not, I genuinely care. I've witnessed a lot of broken relationships and families since the onset of the pandemic. And if that's you, my heart goes out to you. I can only imagine how difficult that must be. Folks are struggling and it's been hard, absolutely. This whole experience has shown us that we're like tea bags. We don't know what we're made of until you put us in hot water. I always say marriages that are only 50-50 leave 50% of the effort on the table. Why not make it 100-100? 
Your kids will thank you for it. This all goes back to empathy and servant leadership and being willing to die to yourself daily for the betterment of others. Sound a little like your favorite superhero? The world, and in particular this nation, could use a healthy dose of conflict resolution served with the main course of empathy. Now, bringing this back to design, I'll always remember what Luke Robluski said to me several years ago. He said, I don't think you're a team until you go through some <laughs> together. Conflict can be and should be healthy as long as it's approached and addressed from a place of genuine care and desire to make people and the outcome better. That's not just product design, that's for everything. Metal on the anvil, scorched and pounded, forges the sword. Sand in the oyster makes the pearl. Coal makes diamonds. Tweet your takeaways, Defenders. I'm at User Defenders and Josh is at Joshua Malden. I want to take a second to do a Patreon shout out. I want to thank Ron Altamira for joining recently. And thank you, Ron, for coming aboard at the master level, man. That's the highest level you can get. So I'm looking forward to our one-on-ones together. Uh, doing some mentoring and greatly appreciate your enthusiasm and support of user defenders and defenders listening I want to shout out to the patreon opportunity It's just sort of a bonus thing. I set up here. There's some really cool perks that you can't get anywhere else You can get stickers you can get one-on-ones with me as I just mentioned and I'll meet with you on a monthly basis and just kind of talk you through some stuff and coach you and Look at your portfolio. We can talk about Kenny Rogers, Jim Cotta, William Shatner, whatever you want. Uh, <laughs> parenting. Uh, so I just want to highly recommend you check it out at userdefenders.com slash Patreon. I want to thank Eli Jorgensen for Josh's astonishing artwork. Check it out. You can see the full artwork on the show notes page at userdefenders.com slash 077. And finally, I want to thank Editor X for sponsoring this episode. They've been greatly supportive of the show and helping to keep the lights on here. So I appreciate them partnering with me. And it's a great product. I've been hearing some great things from designers about how this tool is really revolutionizing the way they build websites much more efficiently with a lot less plugins to worry about. And that can be a real pain in the butt. I totally get it. Highly recommend recommend checking out the product also supporting user defenders by checking it out it's userdefenders.com slash editor x so next month i am super excited to mention my next guest is design leader influencer extraordinaire bob baxley this was an incredible interview. Bob was very generous with his time. I'm glad I started doing interviews on Saturdays because there's a lot less pressure to really try to crank through the interview on both sides, I think, because of work stuff. So this is a great interview. I can't wait to bring it to you. And it was just so rich and Bob was so generous with his wisdom that he's gained through nearly three decades, uh, if not more, of design leadership. So definitely stay tuned. Make sure you're subscribed at userdefenders.com slash subscribe. Thank you so much for listening, Defender. I greatly appreciate you sticking with me and continuing to download and listen to each episode. Thanks for being on this ride. You're why I do this. Sometimes I feel like I don't thank you enough and I just want you to know how much I appreciate you listening and sharing also what you learned and the episodes out there on your social channels. Greatly appreciate you. And last but not least, I want to say, as always, fight on, my friends. I was fully expecting you to ask for dad jokes at the end. <laughs> oh crap. Can we do one like as a as an outtake? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Okay, great. Uh Josh, can, can you give me your best dad joke or your worst, however you look at it? <laughs> um who called them poultry farmers and not chicken tenders? <laughs> That's a good one.
That's that's great. <laughs> Thank God you're putting that at the end of the episode. Like people would just be like leaving. Like, how do I delete this podcast <laughs> from the internet? Make it go away. <laughs>